is Rogers TV. Aurelia. Welcome to Freedom Fighters Code Grey. This is a TV show where we discuss human trafficking, an issue that's happening in our backyard. We often think about the trafficking of persons as something that happens in other countries and other places, but this is an issue that's happening here and it's impacting our community. In fact, children as young as 12 years old are being lured and recruited for the purposes of exploitation right here in Ontario. So today, I'm really excited to have Caitlin on the show with us today. Thank you, Caitlin, for being here and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. So Caitlin is the director of Aftercare at Fight for Freedom. Caitlin, can you just um, share with viewers who are tuning in, they may have never heard of human trafficking or don't really understand what it is. In your own words, what is human trafficking? Sure. Uh, human trafficking can be a little bit difficult to define. There's so many different definitions out there and sometimes they can be really long and convoluted. But essentially, I think human trafficking really boils down to the use of force or manipulation or coercion with the intent of using another person for exploitation for your own gain. Um, and so that can look like forced labor, it can look like forced sexual exploitation, it can look like debt bondage or um, the trafficking of infants for illegal adoption. But the most common thing that we often see is trafficking for forced sexual exploitation and forced labor. And when you were mentioning in your definition and explanation of trafficking, you kind of broke it down in terms of there's an ax and a means and a purpose, right? Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned some of those ways is coercion or manipulation or deception. Um, and so in what ways do we not really understand trafficking. There's like a myth about human trafficking that our world perceives. Could you kind of do some myth busting for us and maybe share a myth about human trafficking and then in reality, what does it actually look like? Sure, and that's such a good question. I think one of the biggest things that people think of when they think of human trafficking is a young person being kidnapped off the street and brought somewhere mm -hmm. else by force and held um, chained up in a basement somewhere. Um, we think of movies like Taken, where that's something that happens. And not to say that people aren't abducted and forced into things like human trafficking, but especially here in Canada, what we see most often is the use of manipulation and coercion more so than force and abduction. And so one of the ways that young people, especially young people, can be trafficked in Canada is through um, people that they know personally, whether that's a significant other or a family member. And those people having a close connection to the person they want to traffic can use sort of mind games and manipulation and subtle threats or um, per that drawing on that personal relationship to control the person more so than the use of force and abduction and the kinds of things that we often think of when we think about human trafficking. It's so interesting that you mentioned that it's often a personal relationship, yeah. like a trusted friend or family member, but it can also be a romantic partner as mm, well. Can absolutely. you talk a little bit about how someone in a romantic relationship could be manipulated and forced into a situation of exploitation? Absolutely. Um, one of the things that we often see with young people, especially teens and preteens, um, and sometimes people in their young adult years, is traffickers will actually target people as a potential significant other. Most often this happens with young girls and men, but it can happen with anybody. Mm. Um, but for the purposes of this, I'm gonna say boyfriend. Um, someone will target a young girl and start to pursue them in a romantic way. They'll take this person out on a date, treat them really wonderfully, and in the attempt of becoming their boyfriend. Um, as that relationship progresses, they will treat this person like gold. This boyfriend will buy them whatever they want, take them on fancy dates, make them feel so special and so important and so loved. And young people today, who doesn't want to be loved, especially in a world where we're told we're just never quite good enough. So having that person in your life telling you all of those things is so important for so many young people. Um, and through that process, this trafficker will actually end up having this person just wrapped right around their finger and they'd be willing to do just about anything for this boyfriend that they love so much and they care about and who's so important to them. Um, through that relationship, there will start to be questions of um, manipulation, emotional abuse perhaps, where the trafficker will make this person start to feel just a little bit less, to gain an extra level of control over them. And that's when we start to see things like, oh, um, 
I have a few friends who would be interested in buying you just this one time to help us make a little bit of extra money. I've spent so much money treating you so well, and I just need some help to catch up. Like, could you do this for me just one time? I love you. It's okay. You're coming home to me at the end of the night, and it'll just be really good for the both of us. And then we can have the life that we've always wanted. But that very quickly turns into every single night, this often girl, but this person ends up being forced to sleep with people or perform sexual services for people that they don't know, that they would never have done on their own terms, but through this process of manipulation and emotional abuse and coercion and love, they end up in a situation that they would never have chosen on their own without ever having been physically forced to do anything. There are so many important things that you just touched on in explaining kind of the grooming process and the manipulation of someone. I know I read a stat through Global News that a third of the traffickers in Ontario are a boyfriend and pose mm -hmm. as that romantic partner. Um, and you were also touching on a kind of like a debt bondage, right? Like I've bought all these mm -hmm. things for you, I've done all these nice things for you, now you owe me and, and you're just gonna do this for a short time to st until we can build a better life together. So thank you for just explaining that for folks and, and breaking that down. I'm really curious to know, when did you first hear about human trafficking? Where did you learn about it? What did that look like? Absolutely, I actually learned about human trafficking when I was 12 years old. I was doing one of those social justice projects for school um, and the teacher had asked us to find a social justice issue in the world and write a short presentation about it for the class. And so through just searching on the internet, I found this issue of human trafficking. And at the time I learned about it, I believe it was in the context of children in Africa being engaged in forced labor. Um, and so I put together a small presentation for my grade seven class, and that's really what sparked my passion for human trafficking. And so over the years, I've learned more about it, obviously began to understand a little bit more about what it looks like beyond that situation I learned about when I was 12 years old. Um, that grew into a strong passion that I had through university. I really tried to focus on human trafficking in as many ways as possible through university as I started to learn about human trafficking here in Canada as well. That's so interesting, and I think um, the fact that you were so at such a young age, hmm. 12, right, and doing your project at school and learning about this issue and that passion started to burn within you that, you know, you wanted to fight for, you know, this injustice and to raise awareness. So what kind of were your next steps to become an advocate for, of human, against human trafficking? What ways did you get involved after you did that presentation in school, you took some courses in university? What were your next steps? Sure, yeah, and so as you mentioned, the first many years actually after I learned about human trafficking. It was really just trying to learn more, doing as many school projects as I could, taking whatever opportunity I could to learn about human trafficking. Um, and from there, I actually learned of an organization called International Justice Mission, IJM. I, I became involved in some of their fundraising campaigns through university, and that is really what helped me to realize that I, as one individual person, could stand up and do something about human trafficking. I could do more than just learn about what the issue was. I could say, this is not okay, I'm not going to stand for it, and I'm actually gonna stand up and help other people learn about what this is. Um, so for a few years, that's kind of where I sat engaging in those awareness and fundraising campaigns. And after university, actually, I started to look for employment. And this position at an organization called Fight for Freedom came and just essentially fell right into my lap. It was something that I hadn't even been truly searching for, and I found it as I was looking for other jobs. And it was so perfect, exactly what I had hoped to do with my entire life. And I am lucky enough that I was able to secure that position, and I've been working there for two years now. Wow, that's amazing. It's so neat to hear your story of learning, really, mm -hmm. about um, human trafficking and the way it looks around the world. An international justice mission is a global organization. So to be a part of that and get mm -hmm. involved in awareness um, campaigns and fundraising events, and then that led you to employment in the fight against human trafficking, I think that's really amazing. So thanks for sharing that with me. I understand now that you're doing your master's mm -hmm. at York University. Could you share a little bit about what is your master's on? What have you been learning and what's your focus area? Absolutely, so I'm in the process of finishing up my master's of development studies at York University as you said. And my focus is on human trafficking and anti-human trafficking work. So I'm currently writing a research project which looks at the anti-human trafficking movement in Canada, speaking with 
and learning from anti-human trafficking organizations that are based in Ontario, understanding what their operations look like, what some of the challenges they face are as they engage in this work, and really looking to answer the question of how we as the anti-trafficking movement can move forward to better serve folks who are experiencing trafficking and are in need of supports and how we can come together to better make sure that that's happening. That is incredible work that you're doing, Caitlin. From my understanding, there's a lack of reliable data and research about the issue, so thanks for taking the time in your degree to focus your research on this area. Mm -hmm. What are some of the findings? I know you're still in the early stages mm -hmm. of writing, but maybe some of the gaps that you see that exist in terms of supports for individuals who have impacted by trafficking, maybe some gaps that you perceive in how organizations are working together or not working together. Mm -hmm. um, could you just share some of your learnings with me? Sure, yeah, it's really interesting that you mentioned how organizations are working together or not. Um, collaboration is one of the biggest challenges that I'm seeing through my research project. Everybody that I have spoken to has such a passion to work together with others who want to end human trafficking. We know that human trafficking is a huge issue and it's impossible to tackle it if we remain isolated. It's really difficult to do anything against this if we sit in our own silos and we don't work together. And so something that I've learned from people in my research study is people want to work together. They want to move into collaboration. They want to build big important projects that will actually have an impact together but it's such a challenge. And so part of that is because many organizations are very ideologically different, and putting those things together is really difficult. And one of the things that I found to be um, very important as we look to collaboration is drawing on shared values, thinking about our end goal. Everyone that I spoke to wants to see human trafficking end. They may have different opinions about how we get there, but the goal is the same. And so how do we work together to ensure that we're working towards that goal, to ensure that we can attain that goal? without having to sit in isolation and, honestly, frustration. Hmm. That's a really interesting perspective that you're bringing here that we have a shared end goal, mm -hmm. right? The end goal is to end human trafficking. And everyone can agree that this is a horrific crime that's happening in almost every community mm -hmm. in Ontario, across Canada, around the world. We want to see the end of that. Yes, we are all different. We all have different perspectives, different approaches mm -hmm. and ways of getting to that goal. But how can we share learnings with one another and work together in a more unified way um, to fight human trafficking, to, you know, make better strides and steps towards really combating this issue. So do you have any ideas or suggestions or a way that you know we could collaborate and uh, work together better to fight human trafficking? Absolutely, such a great question. I don't have really any solid steps that we can take um, because the research that is out there on collaboration in nonprofit work is really thin. There's not a whole lot that's been done. It's agreed on essentially that it's really difficult. Um, but essentially, I really truly believe that we need to be in conversation with one another. We need to try to think about that end goal. We have different opinions about how to get there. We may have different opinions about what is important, but the end goal for us is all the same. So how do we have those conversations? Can we start to talk to each other? Can we start to say, you know what, I disagree with you on this and this, but I know that our hearts are in the same place and I know that we're working towards the same goal. I think communication is so huge mm -hmm. and it's unfortunately really lacking right now. I think um, additionally it's important just to be open, open to other people's experiences and other people's um, opinions about things. Human trafficking is such a complicated issue. Every single person who's experienced trafficking has a slightly different experience and they have a different story, which means that those of us who work with people who've experienced human trafficking also have different experiences and different stories and different opinions based on the people that we support. And so to be able to hear those stories and recognize that this difference in opinion doesn't necessarily mean that we can't come together. It just means that we have diverse experiences and that can actually make us stronger in our approach than mm -hmm. anything. Yeah, diversity is strength, right? Absolutely. And dialogue is so essential and mm -hmm. so important. And at the same time, each individual is so unique in the way that they've experienced life and the way that they think and perceive the world. So thank you so much for just taking the time to share about how you got involved in human trafficking and what you're doing now through research to help better understand this issue and how we can collaboratively work together. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be back in a few minutes to learn from Caitlin about her current work at Fight for Freedom. So tune back in shortly. It's so inspiring to know that there's people out there that are willing to help people who've gone the situation that I've gone through. 
because of United Way, I'm able to stand in front of you today with a good job that I can actually make something of myself. When you become a Rogers volunteer, it's always an opportunity for everybody to come together and try different things that they've never been able to do before. I encourage everybody to be a volunteer at Rogers TV because not only do you grow professionally, you grow personally as well. I would love to be in this field in the future and Rogers TV is the perfect place to find your footing. My name is Tyler Hodgkinson and I'm a Rogers TV volunteer. What kind of show do you want to see on Rogers TV? What interests you? Log on to rogerstv.com, fill out a show proposal, and tell us about your segment idea. We want to know what you want to see. For people who are exiting situations of exploitation locally. The biggest gap that we see in service is housing. We know that affordable housing in Ontario is incredibly difficult to find as it is, but when you add in experiences of trauma, it can become that much more complicated. Individuals who are leaving situations of human trafficking are often in need of very specific support services and supportive housing. There's a few organizations across the province who are working towards housing or who are providing housing presently, but there's a need for so much more. Even those organizations who are providing housing know that there is a need for more housing. We need housing that's available to people immediately after they exit. Crisis intervention housing where people can deal with issues of potentially addiction to different substances, with acute trauma experiences, with challenges related to mental health that come along with trauma and that come along with abuse, and that simply doesn't exist right now. I know that there are a few organizations that are presently working towards opening homes, but the need is just so great. We need to see that happening more and more often, and um, we need to see more supports for people to be able to obtain long long-term affordable housing that's sustainable, that's safe, and that's comfortable and adequate. One thing when you were sharing that it was making me think about was that in regards to housing, you said, okay, we need an emergency housing where, you know, people um, are really exiting a situation of exploitation and, mm -hmm. and can be cared for, that's safe, but then there's also a need for long-term housing. So there's different types of housing that are needed Absolutely. for this specific issue. Some viewers might be thinking, oh, well, there's lots of great shelters that are out there and emergency family situations. Can you talk a little bit about the differences that are needed to care for and support people who are exiting situations of trafficking in particular and why might that differ from another shelter service? Absolutely. I'm so glad that you mentioned shelters. Shelters can be great for folks who are in need of a place to stay, but unfortunately they cannot in most circumstances serve the needs of someone who's leaving a situation of trafficking for a few reasons. One being that most trafficking or sorry, most shelter locations are public. People know where the shelters are. And so if someone's leaving their trafficker and in need of a safe state place to stay and they go to a shelter where the location is public, it's very easy for their trafficker to find them again. Unfortunately, traffickers will actually prey on folks who are living in shelters mm -hmm. because they recognize that there's a sense of vulnerability there, there's a need for financial stability, there's a need for somewhere to stay, and so traffickers sometimes will go into shelters to recruit people to come and work for them and to come and be exploited by them. And so for someone who's been trafficked and experienced that trauma to go into that space, it can be re-traumatizing, but it can also be very dangerous. Shelters are often also not equipped to deal with the specific trauma that comes out of exploitation and trafficking through no fault of their own. It's just not their focus and they don't have the capacity to do that. So to send someone who has experienced trafficking to a shelter is, like I said, unsafe for them, but it's also unfair to the folks who are staying in the shelter who are unable to um, provide those services and those supports as much as I know that they would want to. Are there any housing models that you're aware of that you think are something that we really need to embrace as a province, as a community, as a nation in Canada to help folks exiting situations of exploitation? Hmm. That's a very good question. I know Covenant House has a really great housing model for youth. They have crisis beds for folks who are leaving a situation in need of immediate emergency um, housing. Those beds, I believe, are available for a week or two for the person. And then while staying there, they have the opportunity to apply for short-term housing. And in that space, they're able to stay for about six months to a year, which is awesome. It gives them a place to start to build stability. It gives them a place to start thinking about where they want to go next. But Covenant House, on top of that, has another home where young people can stay for up to two years. And that gives them an opportunity to really build sustainable 
stable situations for their life, especially as teens, it's really difficult to find that. And so that model works really well for them. We need something like that for folks who are older than 18, however, because Covenant House is focused on youth. We need places that are able to provide that crisis housing and then interim housing as well as transitional housing before someone moves on to independent long-term housing. Um, so a model that actually took us through that entire process would be so helpful and is so needed. Hmm. And I think it's really interesting that you point out there's a need for folks who are over the age of 18 for this type of housing. Emergency, almost second stage, right? And then long-term mm -hmm. plans and housing solutions. So hopefully we'll see that happening in our province and nation as more awareness is raised about this issue and we start to identify and address the needs of folks that are exiting situations of exploitation. So Caitlin, in your role as Director of Aftercare at Fight for Freedom, what does that look like? What, what do you do in your role and what does the aftercare team at Fight for Freedom do to support people who are exiting situations of exploitation or exiting the sex industry? Sure, so Fight for Freedom, um, we're focused on supporting individuals who have experienced sexual exploitation, sex trafficking, or sexual violence in the sex industry. We, um, our aftercare team is fantastic. We have a team of six people, um, case managers, uh, support staff, who are working together to provide support to folks who have experienced these things. Our team works with individuals to put together um, unique support plans. We do comprehensive needs assessments with each person who comes through our care. Each person has a unique plan based on their individual experiences, what their needs are, and what their end goals are. And our essentially our goal is to work alongside somebody to find a plan that will help them to reach not just stability and safety, but to actually reach towards their goals and towards their dreams that they have for themselves. Um, one of the things that I think is so important about um, supporting folks who have experienced trafficking is recognizing that individuality, recognizing how unique each experience is and how each person is going to have very different needs. And so our team is just fantastic at putting together those supports. and. Um, on top of that, we are working together with the rest of our team in issues of prevention, looking at what are these root causes that are causing someone to actually end up in a situation of human trafficking and working on raising awareness so that we can prevent those kinds of experiences. I'm really excited about your approach to aftercare mm -hmm. and you're mentioning you know, each individual person is unique and their needs are unique. So it's not like a one size fit all plan to help support someone exiting. Mm -hmm. What are some of those um, ways that you assist someone in that support plan that you're creating. What does that look like when you break it down in terms of assisting someone? Sure, so some of the elements of a support plan often include financial support to help someone gain stability when they're unable to work after these kinds of situations. It may look like support to find housing, support to find employment. We offer art therapy and counseling. We have partners who offer different forms of therapy that are just so helpful for people. Um, in addition to that, we also provide skills training when needed. We have mentors on staff who walk alongside people just to be their friend and just to care for them as individual people and to be there with them through this really difficult journey. We're also doing court support for individuals who end up needing to go to court and testify against their trafficker or for any other situation that they may end up there for. Um, we're also working on building partnerships with more housing organizations so that making those housing connections is simpler because that's still the greatest challenge that we're seeing. Thank you so much for the amazing work that you're doing every day to support people and assisting them in their healing journey. It's so important and I'm just so grateful for what you're doing. In regards to Fight for Freedom as an organization, I understand aftercare is kind of one facet of the organization. Mm -hmm. What are the other arms of the organization? What is the kind of vision and mission of the organization? Absolutely, so Fight for Freedom exists to be an active voice and advocate of justice for those who have experienced sexual exploitation and sex trafficking and to provide the services and supports that people need. And so we work to do this in four different ways under our four arms, um, one of them being aftercare, which I've touched on. We also operate through outreach in spaces where human trafficking is known to happen. We have an education arm that is working on raising awareness among the general public, in businesses, in organizations, and other service providers so that people know what human trafficking 
trafficking looks like so that they can identify it, so that they can support people who've experienced human trafficking, and also so that our young people can understand this is what human trafficking looks like and this is what it would look like if it were to happen to me. So people can be aware and they can know that this situation that could potentially happen to them, what that would look like. Uh, the final arm we have is partnerships. We know that we can't tackle human trafficking alone. Um, and so we're really working towards building a strong partnership network with individuals, with businesses, with churches, with other organizations, with other service providers, with law enforcement, with the government, with schools, with honestly anybody who would be interested and willing so that we can have a strong support network to provide services for those who've experienced human trafficking to raise awareness across a variety of mediums so that we can really see human trafficking end in our country and in our world. Some folks who are watching the show might think, oh, partnerships, maybe that only can happen to folks who are recognized with like a human trafficking protocol mm -hmm. within their organization or working for the government or things like that. But could you give some examples of partnerships that maybe exist or partnerships that you're looking for as an organization? And maybe there's someone um, who's watching the show that would love to help out in that way. Absolutely. We want to build partnerships with, honestly, anyone and everyone, anybody who's interested, anybody who's passionate about ending human trafficking or caring for those who've experienced it, we would love to partner with them. Some of the people that we've partnered with in the past include lawyers, dentists, small business owners, teachers, um, people who teach self-defense classes, like I mentioned before, law enforcement. Um, but we can even build partnerships with people who have no connection to service provision. If you work in a business firm, and this is something that you're interested in, we would love to partner with you as an individual even. Um, some of the other areas that we're always looking for partnership is spaces where we can help meet the needs of those who've experienced human trafficking. So um, whether that be housing providers or even someone who is really skilled at baking or hairstyling or um, any kind of employment opportunity, who would be interested in offering training sessions or apprenticeships, things like that that survivors would be so interested in learning about as they work towards their dreams and their goals. That's amazing. Thanks for sharing. Really quickly, could you share one way that our viewers could get involved in the fight to end human trafficking? Absolutely. So Fight for Freedom has an annual month-long fundraiser called Fab Feb, which runs through the month of February every year. It's um, a really exciting fundraising and awareness campaign where people come together through the month to raise awareness about the issue and also to raise funds to help to continue to fund our programming. So what, how could someone participate in FabFeb? What does that look like? Absolutely. So the biggest way that someone can participate in FabFeb is through our um, bow tie, red ribbon, and lipstick campaign. Folks sign up to participate with us by wearing either a bow tie, a red ribbon, or bright lipstick to stand up and stand out um, as an advocate against human trafficking and to raise awareness. I like to think of it as similar to Movember, but to fight human trafficking here in Canada. Amazing. And I understand people as well can do fundraising initiatives like a bake sale, they could do a movie night or things like that to help raise funds to support the amazing work that you're doing. And we will put a link on our website of where folks can go to um, learn more about Fab Feb. So thank you so much for tuning in to Freedom Fighters Code Grey. Thank you so much, Caitlin, for joining us and for sharing your knowledge and information about human trafficking.